All right, this is going to be an introduction to uh, 17th century literature and today's brief little lecture, and it is going to be brief uh, by way of introduction, is intended to uh, give a, a, a brief synopsis of the Elizabethan world order, which all of the authors that we are going to look at, irrespective of whether they are Protestant or Catholic, or whether they uh, adopt more hermetic approaches to knowledge, will assume of their readers that they have an understanding of. And the reason I'm presenting it to you is that what was common sense for them is no longer common sense for us. And so it's necessary to give something of a sense of how our 17th century authors would have understood the world. And when I say that it is uh, the understanding of the 17th century, one could also say the same of the Elizabethans. And this will be in common, as I say, whether the authors are Protestant or Catholic. Too much is made of the religious differences between uh, Protestants and Catholics in terms of soteriology, which is a very real thing and we're going to see as a, an absolutely pivotal matter in their eyes in the uh, debates and in the politics uh, and in the philosophies uh, adhere to in the day. Nonetheless, there is a common ground, a common worldview that they all possess, which is absolutely fundamental to understanding the poets of the period. And today I am going to seek, uh, albeit briefly, to try and give you something by way of an introduction to that. And I'm gonna start not with the text that I'm ultimately going to come to, which is uh, the uh, book which I recommended to you, The Elizabethan World Picture by E.M.W. Tilliard. And uh, likewise, I could have pointed to you to uh, C.S. Lewis's The Discarded Image, which I think is equally uh, strong uh, and presents itself in slightly different ways. But I would recommend both of those books to you, and I do that in the syllabus. But the first text I want to look at with you is actually Genesis 1, because Genesis 1 generates the worldview of the authors of this period. And it does so for reasons that I'm about to illustrate. But the, the primary things it illustrates are the first few things that uh, Tilliard mentions in his own little booklet, namely the idea of an order in the world. And secondly, the breaches of that order caused by sin. But all writers of the period will adhere to the idea that we live in a created order, which necessitates that there is a creator to it. And so the Genesis 1 text is vital to under, our understanding of the literature. It's the uh, back, not just the background, but it's the presupposition which we need to hold uh, firmly in our minds in order to move forward uh, with understanding. And I'm going to put up uh, that Genesis text on the screen so you don't have to look at my mug the whole time. Uh, and here we have it, uh, or do we? No, that is Tilliard. Here we go. This is Genesis 1. I put it in the KJV, the King James Version, because of course this is uh, the version that appeared in 1611 based off the Geneva Bible and was widely read and it certainly became the authorized version, authorized by the Anglican church, uh, which was not the only Protestant church in England, but it was, certainly was the uh, dominant one. And uh, what I want you to note about this, I'm not gonna read the whole of Genesis one or Genesis one uh, verses two to three, which will really be the foundation uh, that I'd like you to look at. What I want to say here is uh, that this first book has three features to it, and they I'm going to give you them in a way that is a rhyme. Um, it begins with the idea of a supernatural fact. In the beginning, God created the, the heaven and the earth. What we then see are supernatural acts, and the supernatural acts, which stem from the supernatural fact that God created the, heaven, the uh, heaven and the earth in the beginning, articulates that God declares and creates and acts by means of his word. And this word 
word in Hebrew, devar, uh, has this connotation not only of our, under, of our understanding of word of, of speech, but also of action. So when God speaks, he acts. And when he acts, there is an outcome to his action. His actions are always effective. They're not like our words, which we use to try and persuade, and we try and be active and effective with him. His are invariably effective. So the first point is that there is a supernatural fact. The second is that there are supernatural acts. And finally, there is a supernatural pact that will conclude this, uh, ac this exercise in Genesis, this understanding that's articulated here. And God blessed them, Genesis 1, and God said unto them, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. Note that God commands Adam and Eve here. This gives us all sorts of, and the whole account here, which is, uh, in, in many ways, uh, punctuated by various rep repetitive phrases and various uh, orderly um, periods, which we call days, punctuated by light and darkness. And that's actually fascinating that the very first thing that God says is, let there be light, and there was light. Now, light in uh, scripture is, of course, um, having the same very connotations that we use for, the, for what light is. It's something that provides uh, a means by which we can see. It is also an expression of the presence of God, however. It's not unambiguous. Uh, in the wilderness episode in uh, Exodus, uh, God appears to Israel in a fiery pillar by night and in a darksome cloud by day. So God can also appear in the thick darkness. But in general, God is associated with light and his presence. And so the psalmist will say that thy word is a light unto my path and a lamp unto my feet. It's the means by which we can see and discern. And God creates that means of discernment by his word, by the act of articulating that there be light, and by the means of what light connotes and affects, which is that the world is rendered visible. And so we, th we see things by, by the very fact that God has made them visible to us. That does not mean, however, that everything in the world is visible to us and can be seen by us. And so we will find in the Elizabethan period, there are many things that are understood to exist of significance that we cannot see, unseen realms. And I'm going to talk about that when I come to the Elizabethan world order. And I'm going to do that in subsequent videos. And there will be three main emphasis that I'm going to make. One is that there is a great chain of being held to by the period. Secondly, that there is a whole set of correspondences that operate in this world order. It's not random. It's not chaotic. It is ordered. And there are correspondences that reside between the different orders. And finally, and these are all uh, Tilliard's emphasis, Lewis makes the same in the discarded image, that these uh, correspondences exist in relation to one another in the form of a dance. And if you're a, a fan of C.S. Lewis, you'll remember in Paralandra, he concludes that, uh, that second uh, volume of his space trilogy with something like a dance. The Greek word for this is perichoresis. Um, this is not only of significance to Orthodox uh, Christians, it's very important in Orthodox uh, theology. It is understood in the whole Elizabethan period that there is a harmony and there is a movement and there's a joy in the cosmos by virtue of the fact that God, the creator, created him. And I said to you that uh, in my sort of uh, describing the book of Genesis in terms of, of three phases, the, the supernatural fact that God created, the supernatural act by which he created the distinctions, the differentiations, the binary differentiations uh, of the earth, 
and the heavens, that there was also a supernatural pact. And I, let me come back to that point. The supernatural pact shows that God is a lawgiver and that he is good. And we can tell he's good by various other indices, namely that God pronounces the days which he creates and the specificities residing within them to be good. This tells us that goodness matters to God. If we compare this to the accounts in the Babylonian uh, creation accounts, there's nothing like that there, uh, where Marduk slays, uh, uh, what's the name of that beast, that sea beast, something to beginning with a T, a temporary draw a blank here. Um, and from the body of that slain beast, he creates out of that. And this is a uh, this is an epic and gory battle that begins creation. In the Greek and Roman accounts, uh, everything begins in chaos, in flux, and we're not even sure who actually organizes the matter. Although the matter is only held in organization by virtue of a of a tension, which Heraclitus calls uh, love and war, strife and flux, and and. These things are in consistent tension. There is no order or peace or harmony residing in the Greek worldview, at least not fundamentally, likewise in the Roman one. But in the Hebrew understanding, there is. The creation is an orderly creation, and it is good. And the order is not one in which strife and flux are fundamental parts of the creation. That is introduced by the incursion of sin into the world, which comes because of the covenant breach of Adam and Eve in Genesis 3. That's, uh, I'll get to that in a bit, but there's a pact between God and man, and the pact is dependent on a command coming from God, and what's the command? It's to be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth, to fill it. Now, we'll see that in the days leading up to the sixth day, that God first subdues and then fills. Here we see the command to some degree mirrors this and inverts that. He commands Adam and Eve to first fill and then subdue the earth. And so he gives them the dominion mandate, the uh, mandate, or the, and some call it the cultural mandate, which is to create of the Garden of Eden a whole culture to make what God has determined to be good to be even better. So they're given a task, they're given work to do. And it, this explains the, the distinction that the reformers will have, also there to a lesser degree amongst the Catholics. It's, um, it's there, but the emphasis is strong in the reformers that vocation and labor is a good thing. It's pronounced to by God as a command and it's a command before the fall. You are to good, you are to work the garden, till the soil. Remember, Adam and Eve are portrayed in Milton's Paradise Lost as gardeners, and God himself is often using garden metaphors when it comes to scripture. But they are to till the earth, to cultivate the earth, and they're to make it in some ways better. Now, this is the foundation of uh, the understanding of modern science as well, which will develop in the later 17th century, what we now call modern science. It's predicated on the idea that we can look at the natural world and not only receive it as a good and sacred thing because God created it, but also that it is right and fit and suitable and in some ways uh, admirable and commanded for us to understand it better. That underlies that whole period. So modern science is not to be understood as a reaction against the medieval period. In some ways, it's an outflowing of it, which is brought to a particular sharp focus by um, the endeavors of what I would say are the are the Protestants among them and the work so-called Protestant worth work ethic. Um, so those are our seminal uh, influences here, and we will see it working out in terms of the world picture that will result from that. And I'm going to see if I can. Um, uh, oh, one final thing. In the whole Genesis account, it's punctuated. I mentioned the uh, six days of creation, the seventh day on which God rested, and the seventh, by the way, being the absolute pinnacle of God's created order. The purpose of creation is ultimately worship, and that defines those that reside within that world order. So the seventh day is the day of Sabbath rest, but that's the day in which God is 
sets aside to be holy. It's the day in which uh, he is to be enjoyed as, as the, cr the crowning of life. Uh, God is to be enjoyed on the seventh day and worshiped. And that will also affect the understanding of work as well. The purpose of work is worship and worship is going to affect how we work. And so um, in the Jewish calendar, the Sabbath comes on the seventh day because of the resurre resurrection of the son of God on a Sunday, on Easter Sunday, uh, that is inverted. The first day of the week becomes the Sabbath. That's the first day of the week. And so worship grounds the rest of the week. And you'll note to this day in some calendars, um, those that have been influenced by uh, Christian understandings, that Sunday is the first uh, day of the week, not Monday. That's a very different impulse. Um, and uh, one in which we then reside in our own works rather than in the work of God. But there's one final thing. I mentioned the seven days. So the number seven is going to be very important to the Elizabethans. The other number which will be significant is the number 10. Now, the number 10 has significance because of mathematics. Uh, the decimal system uh, understands that as well. But it's also re it's related to this word toledoth in the uh, Hebrews, uh, the account in Genesis 1, which is the word for gener generations, toledoth. There are 10 words, Toledo, uh, that mark the book of Genesis. The book of Genesis is the book of beginnings. This word Toledo appears 10 times. And so the numbers 7 and 10 are used repeatedly in this period, and they relate to cosmology. Let me give you an illustration of cosmology here. If I can manage to get my screen share to function. Now, I've used this illustration many times. I'll come back to it in the next lecture. But this is the cosmology which reigned up until this, this period. Now, it was overturned in the 17th century, which is a, a cosmic event. It has enormous significance, and I will get into that when we come to Mr. John Dunn. But this is the uh, cosmology of Ptolemy, uh, an uh, Egyptian astronomer, and it was more or less accepted as the uh, dominant world or, or cosmology of the ancient world. There was another one, by the way, by Aristarchus, which uh, fits more the modern view, uh, modern worldview, uh, which is that we live in a solar system. We, the, the planets revolve around the sun. Aristarchus taught this. It was not the dominant view. The dominant view was that of Ptolemy, and it was geocentric. At the center of this cosmos was the geo, the earth, from which we get geography and geometry, et cetera. Ge the earth was at the center and then the moon, these are Latin words here, Lunae, Mercury, Veneris, Solus, Martus, Jovis, and Saturni. The, uh, in other words, the moon, Mercury, Venus, the sun, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn. And then outside of that are other spheres, uh, the eighth, the ninth, and the tenth, the tenth heaven. Remember Paul, the apostle says that he was taken up to the tenth heaven. That's not the heaven of heavens, however, that is outside this created order. Remember in the beginning, it says in Genesis 1, God created the heavens and the earth. He also created the heavens. It's also a created thing. But he himself is not created. He is the creator. He is uncreated being who creates by his word, created being. And that includes the heavens. And outside of this all is the primum mobile, the prime mover, the calum imperium habitaculum dei et omnium electorum, the kingdom of heaven or the empire of heaven, the habitation of God and all the elect. These are outside the created order, above the created order. And we, by virtue of that, look uh, up at heaven and also not in, however, from as if we were the insiders and God the outsider, but the other way around, we are the outsiders looking in on what is of ultimate reality, namely God and his people, uh, namely his elect, not all people, but his elect, his saints. Uh, this will be displayed in medieval um, cathedrals and so forth, in millennium windows, like the, the rose windows you'll see in uh, uh, 
continental Europe all over the place. But that picture, you need to have that in your mind. Oh, along with that picture, I, let me return to that ever briefly. Um, the whole of the liberal arts uh, connect, are connected to this. Note that here we will find that along with these um, planets um, and the influence of the planets, because everything influences everything else, by the way, is, a, uh, is the order of music established by Boethius in the fifth century, the eight note scale of harmony, which is believed to reside uh, in not only the uh, music of the, our instruments, but also in the music of the world and ultimately in a celestial divine music that we can't hear. So if you go to Milton's uh, Nativity Ode, he will refer to the music of the spheres, music that is inaudible to our ears and yet corresponds to our musical scale, which also corresponds very exactly to mathematical uh, realities. So there is a not only a symmetry, but an absolute congruence between music and mathematics and geometry and arithmetic, for which reason those four are a part of the quadrivium in the seven liberal arts. So this order is mathematical, inherently mathematical. And this is important. I'll say more about this. I'll come back to it and expand on it in a later lecture, but this is good for now. Um, one final thing I want to say about that is that there is another way of looking at that, this, which brings out some of these features. Um, and it's yet slightly different. And this is the view that is presented by Robert Flood, um, who is a um, hermetic philosopher. He is a, uh, uh, an opponent of, um, uh, uh, what's his name now? I'm just drawing a blank here. Uh, Kepler, Francis Kepler the uh, cosmologist. Um, flood creates a different way of understanding the universe. Now, this is not one that is dominant in the period. However, it is there. And so I, I mentioned it ever so briefly. It works in accordance with the same um, understanding of microcosm and macrocosm, which we, which we see in the period. But he understands the macrocosm showing the human body as the soul of the world. And this is a nude female figure chained to the right hand to God, which is pre presented in Hebrew as uh, Jehovah, and on the left to a monkey representing mankind. And there are astronomical and uh, alchemical symbols there, which I will show you here in this illustration taken from Flood's uh, own work here. And let me put it on the screen. So you can see from Jehovah here in Hebrew, the tetragrammaton, the four letters here. And this is the um, integration of nature uh, and the mirror uh, and art is the mirror of, um, uh, of this image. Sorry, terrible translation um, and, uh, and incorrect at that. Uh, I'll come back to this and correct it in a subsequent lecture. But you can see here this understanding that, um, uh, that is alchemical even. Uh, as opposed to mathematical. So this is part of the scholarly debate of the day, which I just wanted to introduce here as a, not to confuse you, but to explain what we will see here in, which is characteristic of the period that all knowledge is how to hold together. The question then is, does it hold together in a mathematical, rational way, or does it hold together in a um, hermetic, um, uh, and, and, and we could say even um, Gnostic and uh, Rosicrucian fashion, because uh, Flood is accused of being a Rosicrucian, so a mystic. That's going to be a feature of the period as well, but I will stop for now, and I will pick it up next lecture. Thank you.